Virginia Woolf Adeline Virginia Woolf was an English writer, and one of the foremost modernists of the 20th century. During the interwar period, Woolf was a significant figure in London literary society and a central figure in the influential Bloomsbury group of intellectuals. Her most famous works include the novels Mrs. Dalloway, 1925, To the Lighthouse, 1927, and Orlando, 1928, and the book-length essay A Room of One's Own, 1929, with its famous dictum, A woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. Wolf suffered from severe bouts of mental illness throughout her life, thought to have been the result of what is now termed bipolar disorder, and committed suicide by drowning in 1941 at the age of 59. Early Life Virginia Woolf was born Adeline Virginia Stephen at 22 Hyde Park Gate in London. Her parents were Sir Leslie Stephen, 1832-1904, and Julia Princip Duckworth Stephen, née Jackson, 1846-1895. Leslie Stephen was a notable historian, author, critic and mountaineer. He was a founding editor of the Dictionary of National Biography, a work which would influence Woolf's later experimental biographies. Julia Stephen was a renowned beauty, born in British India to Dr. John and Maria Pattle Jackson. She was also the niece of the photographer Julia Margaret Cameron and first cousin of the temperance leader Lady Henry Somerset. Julia moved to England with her mother, where she served as a model for pre raphaelite painters such as Edward Byrne Jones. Wolfe was educated by her parents in their literate and well-connected household at 22 Hyde Park Gate, Kensington. Her parents had each been married previously and been widowed, and, consequently, the household contained the children of three marriages. Julia had three children by her first husband, Herbert Duckworth, George, Stella, and Gerald Duckworth. Leslie first married Harriet Marion, Minnie, Thackeray, 1840-1875, the daughter of William Thackeray, and they had one daughter, Laura Makepeace Stephen who was declared mentally disabled and lived with the family until she was institutionalized in 1891. Leslie and Julia had four children together, Vanessa Stephen, 1879, Phoebe Stephen, 1880, Virginia, 1882, and Adrian Stephen, 1883. Sir Leslie Stephen's eminence as an editor, critic, and biographer, and his connection to William Thackeray, meant that his children were raised in an environment filled with the influences of Victorian literary society. Henry James, George Henry Lewis, and Virginia's honorary godfather, James Russell Lowell, were among the visitors to the house. Julia Stephen was equally well connected. She came from a family of beauties who left their mark on Victorian society as models for pre raphaelite artists and early photographers, including her aunt Julia Margaret Cameron who was also a visitor to the Stephen household. Supplementing these influences was the immense library at the Stephens' house, from which Virginia and Vanessa were taught the classics and English literature. Unlike the girls, their brothers Adrian and Julian, Phoebe, were formally educated and sent to Cambridge, a difference that Virginia would resent. The sisters did, however, benefit indirectly from their brother's Cambridge contacts as the boys brought their new intellectual friends home to the Stevens drawing room. According to Wolfe's memoirs, her most vivid childhood memories were not of London but of St. Ives in Cornwall, where the family spent every summer until 1895. The Stevens summer home, Talent House, looked out over Porthminster Bay, and is still standing today, though somewhat altered. Memories of these family holidays and impressions of the landscape especially the Godrevy Lighthouse, informed the fiction Wolf wrote in later years, most notably to the lighthouse. The sudden death of her mother in 1895, when Virginia was 13, and that of her half-sister Stella two years later, led to the first of Virginia's several nervous breakdowns. She was, however, able to take courses of study, some at degree level, in Greek, Latin. German and History at the Ladies' Department of King's College London between 1897 and 1901, and this brought her into contact with some of the early reformers of women's higher education such as Clara Pater, George Waugh and Lillian Faithful, principal of the King's Ladies' Department and noted as one of the steamboat ladies. 
Her sister Vanessa also studied Latin, Italian, art and architecture at King's Ladies Department. On May 2, 2013, it was announced that Wolf was to be honored by her alma mater when, in autumn 2013, the Virginia Wolf Building of King's College London would open on King's Way, London. The death of her father in 1904 provoked her most alarming collapse and she was briefly institutionalized. Modern scholars, including her nephew and biographer, Quentin Bell, have suggested her breakdowns and subsequent recurring depressive periods were also influenced by the sexual abuse to which she and her sister Vanessa were subjected by their half-brothers George and Gerald Duckworth, which Wolf recalls in her autobiographical essays A Sketch of the Past and 22 Hyde Park Gate. Throughout her life, Wolfe was plagued by periodic mood swings and associated illnesses. She spent three short periods in 1910, 1912 and 1913 at Burley House, 15 Cambridge Park, Twickenham, described as a private nursing home for women with nervous disorder. Though this instability often affected her social life, her literary productivity continued with few breaks throughout her life. Bloomsbury. After the death of their father and Virginia's second nervous breakdown, Vanessa and Adrian sold 22 Hyde Park Gate and bought a house at 46 Gordon Square in Bloomsbury. Wolf came to know Lytton Strachey, Clive Bell, Rupert Brooke, Saxon Sidney Turner, Duncan Grant, Leonard Wolf, John Maynard Keynes, David Garnett, and Roger Ferry, who together formed the nucleus of the intellectual circle of writers and artists known as the Bloomsbury Group. Several members of the group attained notoriety in 1910 with the Dreadnought Hoax, which Virginia participated in disguised as a male Abyssinian royal. Her complete 1940 talk on the hoax was discovered and is published in the memoirs collected in the expanded edition of The Platform of Time, 2008. In 1907 Vanessa married Clive Bell, and the couple's interest in avant-garde art would have an important influence on Wolfe's development as an author. Virginia Stephen married writer Leonard Wolfe on August 10, 1912. Despite his low material status, Wolfe referring to Leonard during their engagement as a penniless Jew the couple shared a close bond. Indeed, in 1937, Wolfe wrote in her diary, Love making, after 25 years can't bear to be separate. You see it is enormous pleasure being wanted, a wife. And our marriage so complete. The two also collaborated professionally, in 1917 founding the Hogarth Press, which subsequently published Virginia's novels along with works by T.S. Eliot, Lawrence Van Der Post, and others. The press also commissioned works by contemporary artists, including Dora Carrington and Vanessa Bell. The ethos of the Bloomsbury Group encouraged a liberal approach to sexuality, and in 1922 she met the writer and gardener Vitus Ackville West wife of Harold Nicholson. After a tentative start, they began a sexual relationship, which, according to Sackville West, was only twice consummated. In 1928, Wolfe presented Sackville West with Orlando, a fantastical biography in which the eponymous hero's life spans three centuries and both sexes. Nigel Nicholson, Vita Sackville West's son, wrote the effect of Vita on Virginia is all contained in Orlando the longest and most charming love letter in literature, in which she explores Vita, weaves her in and out of the centuries, tosses her from one sex to the other, plays with her, dresses her in furs, lace and emeralds, teases her, flirts with her, drops a veil of mist around her. After their affair ended, the two women remained friends until Wolfe's death in 1941. Virginia Woolf also remained close to her surviving siblings, Adrian and Vanessa. Phoebe had died of typhoid fever at the age of 26. Work Wolf began writing professionally in 1900, initially for the Times Literary Supplement with a journalistic piece about Haworth, home of the Bronte family. Her first novel, The Voyage Out, was published in 1915 by her half-brother's imprint, Gerald Duckworth & Company Limited. This novel was originally titled Melimbrosia, but Wolfe repeatedly changed the draft. An earlier version of The Voyage Out has been reconstructed by Wolfe scholar Louise de Salvo and is now available to the public under the intended title. 
Dr. Salvo argues that many of the changes Wolf made in the text were in response to changes in her own life. Wolf went on to publish novels and essays as a public intellectual to both critical and popular success. Much of her work was self-published through the Hogarth Press. She is seen as a major 20th century novelist and one of the foremost modernists. Wolfe is considered a major innovator in the English language. In her works she experimented with stream of consciousness and the underlying psychological as well as emotional motives of characters. Wolfe's reputation declined sharply after World War II, but her importance was re-established with the growth of feminist criticism in the 1970s. Virginia Woolf's peculiarities as a fiction writer have tended to obscure her central strength. Woolf is arguably the major lyrical novelist in the English language. Her novels are highly experimental, the narrative, frequently uneventful and commonplace, is refracted, and sometimes almost dissolved, in the character's receptive consciousness. Intense lyricism and stylistic virtuosity fuse to create a world overabundant with auditory and visual impressions. Wolf has often been credited with stream of consciousness writing alongside her modernist contemporaries like James Joyce and Joseph Conrad. The intensity of Virginia Woolf's poetic vision elevates the ordinary, sometimes banal settings, often wartime environments, of most of her novels. For example, Mrs. Dalloway, 1925, centers on the efforts of Clarissa Dalloway, a middle-aged society woman, to organize a party even as her life is paralleled with that of Septimus Warren Smith, a working-class veteran who has returned from the First World War bearing deep psychological scars. To the Lighthouse, 1927, is set on two days ten years apart. The plot centers on the Ramsey family's anticipation of and reflection upon a visit to a lighthouse and the connected familial tensions. One of the primary themes of the novel is the struggle in the creative process that beset painter Lily Briscoe while she struggles to paint in the midst of the family drama. The novel is also a meditation upon the lives of a nation's inhabitants in the midst of war, and of the people left behind. It also explores the passage of time, and how women are forced by society to allow men to take emotional strength from them. Orlando, 1928 is one of Virginia Woolf's lightest novels. A parodic biography of a young nobleman who lives for three centuries without aging much past thirty, but who does abruptly turn into a woman, the book is in part a portrait of Woolf's lover Vita Sackville West. It was meant to console Vita for the loss of her ancestral home, though it is also a satirical treatment of Vita and her work. In Orlando, the techniques of historical biographers are being ridiculed. The character of a pompous biographer is being assumed in order for it to be mocked. The Waves, 1931, presents a group of six friends whose reflections, which are closer to recitatives than to interior monologues proper, create a wave-like atmosphere that is more akin to a prose poem than to a plot-centered novel. Flush, a biography, 1933, is a part fiction, part biography of the Cocker Spaniel owned by Victorian poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning. The book is written from the dog's point of view. Wolfe was inspired to write this book from the success of the Rudolf Bezier play, The Barretts of Wimpole Street. In the play, Flush is on stage for much of the action. The play was produced for the first time in 1932 by actress Catherine Cornell. Her last work, Between the Acts, 1941, sums up and magnifies Wolfe's chief preoccupations, the transformation of life through art, sexual ambivalence, and meditation on the themes of flux of time and life, presented simultaneously as corrosion and rejuvenation, all set in a highly imaginative and symbolic narrative encompassing almost all of English history. This book is the most lyrical of all her works, not only in feeling but in style, being chiefly written in verse. While Wolfe's work can be understood as consistently in dialogue with Bloomsbury, particularly its tendency, informed by G. E. Moore, among others, towards doctrinaire rationalism, it is not a simple recapitulation of the coterie's ideals. Wolfe's works have been translated into over fifty languages, by writers such as Jorge Luis Borges and Marguerite Yorsener. Attitudes Toward Judaism, Christianity and Fascism Wolf was criticized by some as an anti-Semite, despite her being happily married to a Jewish man. 
This anti-Semitism is drawn from the fact that she often wrote of Jewish characters in stereotypical archetypes and generalizations, including describing some of her Jewish characters as physically repulsive and dirty. The overwhelming and rising 1920s and 1930s anti-Semitism possibly influenced Virginia Woolf. She wrote in her diary, I do not like the Jewish voice. I do not like the Jewish laugh. However, in a 1930 letter to the composer Ethel Smith, quoted in Nigel Nicholson's biography Virginia Woolf, she recollects her boasts of Leonard's Jewishness confirming her snobbish tendencies, how I hated marrying a Jew what a snob I was, for they have immense vitality. In another letter to Smith, Woolf gives a scathing denunciation of Christianity, seeing it as self-righteous egotism, and stating my Jew has more religion in one toenail, more human love, in one hair. Wolf and her husband Leonard hated and feared 1930s fascism with its anti-Semitism even before knowing they were on Hitler's blacklist. Her 1938 book Three Guineas was an indictment of fascism. Death After completing the manuscript of her last, posthumously published, novel, Between the Acts, Wolf fell into a depression similar to that which she had earlier experienced. The onset of World War II the destruction of her London home during the Blitz, and the cool reception given to her biography of her late friend Roger Ferry all worsened her condition until she was unable to work. On March 28, 1941, Wolfe put on her overcoat, filled its pockets with stones, walked into the river Owls near her home, and drowned herself. Wolfe's body was not found until April 18, 1941. Her husband buried her cremated remains under an elm in the garden of Monk's house, their home in Rodmore, Sussex. In her last note to her husband she wrote, Modern Scholarship and Interpretations Though at least one biography of Virginia Woolf appeared in her lifetime, the first authoritative study of her life was published in 1972 by her nephew Quentin Bell. Herman Lee's 1996 biography Virginia Woolf provides a thorough and authoritative examination of Woolf's life and work. In 2001 Louise de Salvo and Mitchell A. Liska edited the letters of Vitus Ackville West and Virginia Woolf. Julia Briggs's Virginia Woolf, An Inner Life, published in 2005, is the most recent examination of Woolf's life. It focuses on Woolf's writing, including her novels and her commentary on the creative process, to illuminate her life. Thomas Source's book My Madness Saved Me, The Madness and Marriage of Virginia Woolf, ISBN 0-7658-0321-6, was published in 2006. Feminism Recently, studies of Virginia Woolf have focused on feminist and lesbian themes in her work, such as in the 1997 collection of critical essays, Virginia Woolf, Lesbian Readings, edited by Eileen Barrett and Patricia Crummer. Woolf's best-known non-fiction works, A Room of One's Own, 1929, and Three Guineas, 1938, examine the difficulties that female writers and intellectuals face because men hold disproportionate legal and economic power in the future of women in education and society. In the second sex, 1949, Simone de Beauvoir counts, of all women who ever lived, only three female writers, Emily Bronte, Woolf and sometimes Catherine Mansfield, who have explored the given. Mental illness Much scholarship has been made of Woolf's mental illness, described as a manic depressive illness in Thomas Caramagno's 1992 book, The Flight of the Mind, Virginia Woolf's Art and Manic Depressive Illness in which he also warns against the neurotic genius way of looking at mental illness, where people rationalize that creativity is somehow born of mental illness. In two books by Stephen Trombley, Wolfe is described as having a confrontational relationship with her doctors, and possibly being a woman who is a victim of male medicine, referring to the contemporary relative lack of understanding about mental illness. Irene Coates's book Who's Afraid of Leonard Wolfe? A case for the sanity of Virginia Woolf holds that Leonard Woolf's treatment of his wife encouraged her ill health and ultimately was responsible for her death. Though extensively researched, this view is not accepted by Leonard's family. Victoria Glendinning's book Leonard Woolf, 
a biography argues that Leonard Wolfe was not only supportive of his wife but enabled her to live as long as she did by providing her with a life and atmosphere she needed to live and write. Virginia's own diaries support this view of the Wolfe's marriage. Controversially, Louise A. de Salvo reads most of Wolfe's life and career through the lens of the incestuous sexual abuse Wolfe suffered as a young woman in her 1989 book Virginia Wolfe, The Impact of Childhood Sexual Abuse on Her Life and Work. Wolfe's fiction is also studied for its insight into shell shock, war, class and modern British society. Depictions Michael Cunningham's 1998 Pulitzer Prize-winning novel The Hours focused on three generations of women affected by Wolfe's novel Mrs. Dalloway. In 2002, a film version of the novel was released starring Nicole Kidman as Wolfe, a role for which he won the 2002 Academy Award for Best Actress. A film also starred Julianne Moore and Meryl Streep and featured an award-winning score by American composer Philip Glass. Susan Sellers' novel Vanessa and Virginia, 2008, explores the close sibling relationship between Wolfe and her sister, Vanessa Bell. It was adapted for the stage by Elizabeth Wright in 2010 and first performed by Moving Stories Theatre Company. Bibliography Novels the Voyage Out, 1915, OCLC 4802497, Night and Day, 1919, Jacob's Room, 1922, Mrs. Dalloway, 1925, To the Lighthouse, 1927, Orlando, 1928, The Waves, 1931, The Years, 1937, Between the Acts, 1941. Short Story Collections Kew Gardens, 1919, Monday or Tuesday, 1921, A Haunted House and Other Short Stories, 1944, Mrs. Dalloway's Party, 1973, The Complete Short of Fiction, 1985, Carlyle's House and Other Sketches, 2003 Biographies Virginia Woolf published three books to which she gave the subtitle A Biography. Orlando, A Biography, 1928, usually characterized as a novel inspired by the life of Vita Sackville West. Flush, A Biography, 1933, more explicitly cross-genre, fiction a stream of consciousness tale by Flush, a dog. Non-fiction in the sense of telling the story of the owner of the dog, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Reprinted in 2005 by Persephone Books, Roger Ferry, A Biography, 1940, usually characterized as non-fiction, however, novelistic skills worked against her talent as a biographer, for her impressionistic observations jostled uncomfortably with the simultaneous need to marshal a multitude of facts. Non-fiction books Modern Fiction, 1919, The Common Reader, 1925 a Room of One's Own, 1929, On Being Ill, 1930, The London Scene, 1931, The Common Reader, Second Series, 1932, Three Guineas, 1938, The Death of the Moth and Other Essays, 1942, The Moment and Other Essays, 1947, The Captain's Death Bed and Other Essays, 1950, Granite and Rainbow, 1958, Books and Portraits, 1978, Women and Writing, 1979, Collected Essays, Four Volumes. Drama Freshwater, a comedy, performed in 1923, revised in 1935, and published in 1976. Translations Stagrugin's Confessioning the Plan of the Life of a Great Sinner, from the Notes of Fyodor Dostoevsky, Translated in partnership with S.S. Kotelyansky, 1922. Autobiographical Writings and Diaries A Writer's Diary, 1953, Extracts from the Complete Diary, Moments of Being, 1976, A Moment's Liberty, The Shorter Diary, 1990, The Diary of Virginia Woolf, Five Volumes, Diary of Virginia Woolf from 1915 to 1941. Passionate Apprentice, The Early Journals, 1897-1909, 1990, Travels with Virginia Woolf, 
1993, Greek Travel Diary of Virginia Woolf, edited by Jan Morris, The Platform of Time, Memoirs of Family and Friends, Expanded Edition, edited by S. P. Rosenbaum, London, Hesperus, 2008. Letters Congenial Spirits, The Selected Letters, 1993, The Letters of Virginia Woolf 1888-1941, six volumes, 1975-1980, Paper Darts, The Illustrated Letters of Virginia Woolf, 1991. Prefaces, Contributions Selections autobiographical and imaginative from the works of George Gissing ed. Alfred C. Gissing, with an introduction by Virginia Woolf, London and New York, 1929. Photograph Albums Monk's House Photograph Album 1, 1863-1938 Digital Facsimile at Horton Library, Harvard University, Monk's House Photograph Album 2, 1909-1922 Digital Facsimile at Horton Library, Harvard University Monk's House Photograph Album 3, 1890-1933 Digital Facsimile at Horton Library, Harvard University, Monk's House Photograph Album 4, 1890-1947 Digital Facsimile at Horton Library, Harvard University, Monk's House Photograph Album 5, 1892-1938 Digital Facsimile at Horton Library, Harvard University Monk's House Photograph Album 6, 1850-1900 Digital Facsimile at Horton Library, Harvard